All right, so let's get this talk started here. All right, you all are here to listen about Crossplane, so let's get the Crossplane Maintainer Track talk going. So my name is Jared, this is Philippe over here, and we are both very involved in the Crossplane project. So this is always an interesting talk because we try to have something for everybody. We try to have some intro material. We try to dive, dive deeper into some topics. So we want to have something for everybody. So quick show of hands, who has never used Crossplane before ever? Awesome. This slide is for you. What is Crossplane? <laughs> so Crossplane is your cloud native control plane. You can use it to manage all of your resources. You can compose those resources into like higher level abstractions and then offer those to your developers so that they can provision infrastructure when they need it. Kubernetes, awesome control plane, really, really good for containers, but Crossplane goes and teaches it how to manage like everything else, basically. Control planes are not a new concept, right? Cloud providers have been using control planes for years, so it's not a new concept, but now it's your turn to build your own control plane using Crossplane. So we've been doing this for a bit. We are, we've been around for a little bit over five years now, uh, and we now have an official formal proposal to graduate with the CNCF. Uh, so one of the things that really hit me hard when we were pulling together the proposal is how many people have gotten involved in the project. So almost 2,000 people have contributed to the project in some way now, which is absolutely amazing. We're in the top 10% of, uh, of all CNCF projects for people that are writing code for it. Almost 700 people have written code for Crossplane, which pff, just blows my mind. It's amazing. Almost 350 companies have contributed something to Crossplane too. So this community is getting bigger. Uh, the, company, the, the project is mature. Um, it's, it's amazing to see this growth. Um, and obviously, lots of people are using it, right? So there's, it's in use in production at scale by lots of companies that you may recognize as well. OK, so back to the basics for folks. So manage resources, key concept in Crossplane. So every resource out there in the cloud, let's say AWS, there is a Crossplane resource to represent it. So all the you know, 900, I don't know, more than that services AWS has, there's a Crossplane managed resource for basically all of them. So each managed resource is exposed in the Kubernetes API as an object. So we've got this S3 bucket here, and then it's got you know, uh, what you'd expect out of a Kubernetes object. It's got a spec, it's got config fields, uh, it's got status, it's got events. So it's a well-behaved Kubernetes object, and it represents an external resource that's out there in the real world for your control plane to manage. So how does that work? Uh, well, probably like you expect, so you take a Kubernetes cluster, you put Crossplane in there, you added some pro providers for Crossplane as well, like the AWS provider. Uh, the provider has a series of controllers that you know, watch for events from the API server. And when you create a, uh, an object uh, with the Kubernetes API server, probably through like GitOps or something, it's like create an, uh, an S3 bucket. The API server tells the Crossplane controllers to go and reconcile that with the real world. The S3 controller goes and talks to AWS over their API and makes that S3 bucket happen out there in the real world. So providers are what makes Crossplane know about external resources and kind of extend it further. So there's some big provider news as of late. So Upbound, uh, we created a framework and tooling to basically take any Terraform provider out there and then just code gen, generate a Crossplane provider for it. So we've did that with a few of the popular providers. Uh, and then we've gone ahead and donated that tooling, the providers themselves, et cetera, to the Crossplane community. So those are all part of the upstream uh, Crossplane project now. Along with that, uh, there was an architecture change in those providers as well, which led to some fairly massive performance improvements. So we're talking like more than 90% uh, improvements in CPU and memory usage, sometimes like 1,000x time to readiness improvements, um, which maybe says something about how slow it was to begin with. But still, it's fast now. They have a lot of coverage of all the resources, the reliable, performant, ready for production, and they're part of the Crossplane community now. So there's some links there in the Crossplane Contrib org to check out those providers. Um, and I think those are definitely ready for folks to be using in production. Where can you find? All the Crossplane extensions, there's configurations, there's providers, there's functions, there's all this stuff that teaches Crossplane more tricks. And the place to find them is in this Crossplane marketplace. So you can go there, you can find all the extensions to Crossplane, you can see their documentation, how to use them, examples, all that stuff. <clears throat> so marketplace.upbound.io, that's where to go find all the extensions to Crossplane. All right, so gonna go one level higher now. 
We talked about the managed resources, and now it's time to talk about assembling those resources into higher level abstractions and basically building your own platform API. So a good example here is composing together as a platform engineer, composing together GKE, a node pool, network, subnet, all those things, and then offering that as a simple higher level cluster abstraction to your developers so that they have like a limited surface area of configurations, just a few con configuration knobs that you expose for them, and they can get a cluster for their workloads when they need it. Uh, all the complexity about how the cl cloud providers work, your, the configuration it takes, the policy, all that stuff is below the API line, and then your, your developers get a very simple experience on top of that. So this is what it looks like. This is a really important model in Crossplane to visualize. So your developer on the left, uh, your, your app team, they have a simple abstraction, a claim, and that's their interface to be able to get infrastructure. Behind the API line, you as the platform engineer have defined uh, your platform API with the composite resource definition. That's the shape of your API, what config knobs you want to expose, all that stuff. And then you write compositions to say, this is the resources I want to bring together. This is how I'm going to compose them. This is how configuration values flow, all that sort of stuff. To make it more tangible, we as a platform engineer have created a Postgres abstraction, a database abstraction. So our engineer, uh, she says, I want a small Postgres, please. And then uh, behind the API line, we, this uh, composition that we've written for AWS specifically, it could be GCP, it could be Azure, it could be you know, gold, silver, cheap, expensive, whatever. We have an AWS composition here, and that happens to be for Postgres, an RDS instance, DB parameter group, security group, probably some networking stuff, et cetera. But to the developer, all they've asked for is one small Postgres, please, and the complexity of all the infrastructure and what it takes to do that is in your hands as a platform engineer, and exactly as you set it to happen, goes and happens in the real world. So this is what they look like. To define your own platform API, you use a composite resource definition in Crossplane, and there's basically like two things, you, two high-level areas you need to do. You say, this is the type, this is the API object that I want to expose to my developers, and then you define the schema for it. What configuration knobs do you want to expose? Uh, what is the shape of your platform API? Then you write a couple, uh, at least one composition, maybe a couple of them, so you have options at runtime. And now this is something that has changed recently. So in mainstream, mainline crossplane right now, to compose resources together, what you use is a pipeline of functions. So there'll be a series of functions that execute, and those are, those are what define how to compose the resources together, how to mutate their values, and how to end up at tangible resources in the real world. So let's talk more about functions. So we said it's a pipeline of simple functions to compose resources, that's true. Uh, really important things to notice here is that they are written in your language of choice. If you want to write a function to capture your unique platform logic into one place, you can do that within your language of choice, with your tools, all that stuff. And we're trying with the design here to find a sweet spot between all declarative, no code at all, and then building an entire controller, building, you know, all, writing all the reconciliation loop logic, all that stuff. We're trying to find a sweet spot in the middle so you focus only on your, your platform's unique needs. So also really important, you don't have to write code to do this. You know, if you have unique needs and you want to write code to define your platform, great, write a function for it. Otherwise though, there's a bunch of functions within the ecosystem now that you can use and you don't have to write the code yourself. And this is what it looks like to write code. This is Go. Uh, we're programmatically, dynamically creating a bucket, an S3 bucket. We're assigning values to it. We can take in input, blah, blah. We can use code to write, you know, build our infrastructure, you know, unit tests, linters, validators, all that stuff. Great stuff. If you don't want to write code, then there's lots and lots of functions to use. So this one here is a template function. So in your composition, you can say, hey, run a function for templates. Here's my template. Make it happen. Also, you could do things like use Q scripts if you wanted to. Uh, KCL, there's a bunch of different experiences that are popping up now with functions that mean you don't have to write the code yourself, you just get all these new experiences to define your platform in the way that you want to. All right, this is the thing I was most looking forward to in this talk. All the folks that raised their hand earlier that have not used Crossplane, you won't understand this, but the folks that have used Crossplane, it can be challenging to use sometimes. 
we have taken that to heart and really trying to make crossplane easier to use and faster to use and all that stuff too. So two huge improvements here. One, crossplane is now more powerful and flexible than it's ever been before. You can literally do things that were impossible before in crossplane. A year ago, you could not do all this stuff. Now you can, and a whole world has opened up now. You can do it in your language and your tools of choice, and there's more and more functions like every week, basically. So that ecosystem is growing. Lots of things you can do with crossplane now. And maybe more important is that you can, when you're building your control plane with crossplane, you can successfully get it running in, in, into production easier and faster than ever before also. Basically, the concept is we took all this work that you have to do, shifted it left, so you can do it on your local laptop, rapidly iterate, get it correct, before you ever touch a live control plane. So we're gonna see that in this demo in just a second with uh, all this new cross-plane tooling. This stuff did not exist like six months ago, basically. So there's all this tooling for the full life cycle of your control plane, initializing a new cross-plane project, testing it locally, you know, when it's out there running in the real world, tracing through things, observability, all that stuff. These are all new tools that didn't exist like six, nine months ago or so. Okay, demo time. I am pumped on this demo. And let's see if it works well on this window here that is not very visible for me. All right. Okay, 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 okay. So we are gonna go back in time a little bit and we are going to build a platform with Crossplane the hard way. So a year ago or so, uh, I am a platform engineer. I wanna expose database as a service to my engineers. So I've created this database abstraction for them. When they wanna create a database, they can say, cool, give me an Acme database and make it 100 gigabytes, please. That's the only config knob I've given them. Now, under the covers, what I did as a platform engineer to make that happen is that I created a XRD that basically says, that here's the platform API for databases, here's the shape of it. Uh, you can ignore most of this stuff, but the key part here is that I'm exposing this one storage knob that says how many gig gigabytes the developer wants. Then I write a composition and I basically say, okay, for this composition for a database, what that means here in my organization is it's a Cloud SQL database. It's gonna run Postgres, and then the default will be 10 gigs for the disk, but that value that the um, engineer gave of the disk, uh, like how much storage they want, I'll patch that down into the Cloud SQL instance. So in the cloud, the, what the developer wanted will happen. Cool, so let's do that. Let's go ahead and, as a platform engineer, like apply my definition, my composition, it's on the, on the service, or sorry, on my control plane now. Cool, I'm gonna test this. Does it work? Let's see if it actually works or not. So I will k okay, apply dash f pre claim. So I'll create an instance of that claim, which if I recall correctly, was 100 gigs or so. Cool, 100 gigs. So I'm testing this. Did this, is this database coming up? Does it work? Is it 100 gigs? Well, but, I don't know, let's see. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is, actually, let's just look at stuff here. Throwing stuff in there. Yeah, okay, it's, it's not ready yet. Uh, here's the database object that's like the real thing in Google Cloud right now. Uh, it's not ready yet. Um, is it like what we asked for it to be, though? Did my logic in my composition work? Mm, let's see. Uh, oh, man, it did not work. That stinks, because I wanted a 100 gig database. I got a 10 gig one. Um, and I had to go to a live control plane and like spin up infrastructure in Google Cloud to test this thing. <laughs> Can't there be an easier way to do this, like a faster way to do this? This is, this, is, this is too hard, I don't like this. Yes, there is a faster way to do this. It's 2024, Crossplane v1.15 is out, and we're gonna do this the easy way now. All right, so that old style uh, patch and transform composition, it had a bug in it. I don't know where, I had to go to the real world to try it. Nah. I'm going to use new crossplane tooling to convert. It's a little small. Let's say make it a little bit bigger. Sorry, folks. All right. I am going to use this crossplane tooling to convert that, uh, that old composition to a new function based one. So automatically migrated. Cool. It's done. It's there. It's ready to try. Now I'm going to use local tooling to test this all on my local laptop. I'm gonna say crossplane, please render out that composition for me with these particular values. Uh, let me know what happens. Crossplane runs it all on my local laptop here. Ah, here's the problem. My default of 10 gigs is there, but then this silly patch that I typoed 
is also there, DISC size instead of DISK size. Uh, there's the bug right there, found it. Okay, let's fix it. So we go to our composition that's based on functions and we go ahead and fix that now. So it's with the K, we save it. Let's try it again. So we asked all of my local laptop here, I'm not touching the real world. We run it again, cool, 100 gigs, that looks like it works, that's awesome. Now, now to my human eyes, this looks like the Cloud SQL database will work correctly, um, that's good. But uh, let's do a little bit further validation of this. So let's also go ahead and one more command where we'll run the render on the local laptop, we'll test our composition function, we'll test our composition, we'll make sure it looks good, and then we'll go ahead and pass it to more new tooling of the crossplane validate command, and then that will tell us that everything is all good. It's gonna look at the schemas for it, it's gonna make sure all the fields are correct, everything's all good. So on our local laptop, instead of out there in the real world where that database probably is still spinning up now, yeah, it's still not even ready yet. Um, so we have made Crossplane way easier to use by basically shifting all this stuff left and you can do it all in your local laptop and Crossplane is easy to use now. So Philippe, your turn, my friend. Okay, so yeah, as Jared said earlier, composition functions are a way to teach uh, uh, crossplane new tricks, and uh, we um, composition functions were introduced in alpha in the 1.11 version of crossplane, but we actually completely reworked them and uh, released the beta version in 1.14. So if you previously tried composition functions in 1.11, uh, let's have a look, uh, you, you should have definitely have a look at, at uh, the version we shipped with 1.14 because that's completely different. And let's see a few additions uh, we actually added recently. We uh, added um, a Python SDK, which is actually a way um, to have a first-class citizen uh, experience, developer experience, uh, to develop uh, um, composition functions using Python. Previously, you could do that with Go, but now you can, actually, you can also use that with, uh, do that with Python. And uh, um, uh, with that, we also released a template repository, which you can use from uh, GitHub directly, or also from, as uh, Jared was mentioning earlier, using the init subcommand of the crossplane CLI. About metrics, uh, we added some uh, nice uh, things for the ob observability of composition functions, uh, like uh, uh, exposing the number of calls and the, uh, the time, some statistics about the execution times of uh, functions so that you can monitor your functions uh, and uh, see how they are behaving and if there is anything you should improve to get your composition times uh, uh, tighter. And then uh, we also added a uh, completely new feature to functions uh, quite recently in 1.15, uh, which is the capability to request additional, uh, additional extra resources. So functions can actually request uh, back to crossplane additional cluster scoped resources, which usually are uh, everything crossplane handles and uh, can use those uh, as part of their composition. So it can actually, uh, it's kind of, es essentially it's a very flexible cross-resource reference. And uh, obviously functions can expose that with whatever API they want uh, through the input as we saw that. So we're gonna see a bit more later. As I was saying, uh, we revamped completely composition functions in 1.14, which proved to be the right choice because we, say, we saw the uh, ecosystem of functions actually thriving. Jared already showed a few ones, but we'll go uh, rapidly through a few highlights of uh, the available functions uh, at the moment. Function KCL, 
uh, is uh, um, another, um, another function that allows you to define your composition logics completely in KCL. KCL is a uh, constraint-based uh, uh, language, um, which is actually a CNCF sandbox project. And so you can actually write uh, stuff like for loops and uh, conditions, so which obviously they seem obvious, but given the previous uh, inter-implementation of uh, composition, uh, composition Composition in general, it's actually a pretty good achievement uh, to have all these features and the whole power of uh, KCL to be able to, to define your compositions. Similarly to that, uh, we have a function Q, which allows you to define your composition logic in Q. Here we can see a part of a more complex uh, uh, in composition function using, using Q, which is actually um, uh, composing an S3 bucket and creating um, YAM policies for an, uh, an S3 bucket if, uh, only if uh, a base ARN is provided, and also checking if there are additional ARNs uh, to, be, to create uh, uh, additional policies for. And then we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about this one later, but leveraging the extra resources functionality, the, what previously was possible to be done in, in tree is now uh, with uh, uh, environment configs and the composition environment functionality can now be completely reproduced by a function. And so we can obviously see how uh, in the future we could have more generic uh, uh, composition functions doing more stuff also. Function self filter. It's another kind of. It's a different kind of uh, function. It's actually um, a, while the previous ones we saw are actually kind of uh, producer functions, so stuff you expect to use at the, the start of your pipeline and then uh, maybe go through other functions, other simpler functions that modify the result of that more complex functions. This, one's, this one is exactly that. It's a simple function whose only job is to filter out resources based on some expression you can define in cell. Uh, it's actually in this case, for example, the usual function patch and transform is creating a bucket, but function patch and transform doesn't expose any way to filter out uh, or any easy way to, uh, to filter out resources and to create resources only on conditions. And so we can filter out uh, downstream this bucket uh, and only create it uh, if uh, the spec export field of the composite resource is set to S3. So that's definitely useful. And then one again, uh, once again, function sequencer. Uh, this one is about uh, uh, defining um, dependencies between multiple resources. Uh, so you can define multiple sequences, as you can see down there in the rules. Uh, in this case, for example, second resource and third resource uh, depend on the, on, the third, on the core resource. And so only once uh, the core resource is ready, it's going to be uh, second resource and third resource are going to be created. So that's pretty awesome too. Another one, function switcher. Uh, this one is about uh, exposing, uh, simply exposing some annotations uh, at the uh, composite resource level. And you can actually filter out uh, uh, or enable or disable resources based on whatever the upstream user uh, is, uh, is deciding. So that's a nice addition too. And obviously, there is a lot of functions to be, to be written. So Feel free to reach out on, uh, on, uh, on the Crossplane Slack channel and, uh, and we can definitely help you out. And it's super awesome to see so many contributions from the community. Let's talk now about composition environments. Composition environments are an alpha feature that uh, we already spoke about the function environment configs. So it's uh, uh, the, let's say, original implementation of that, the entry implementation of that. That's still, uh, as I said, an alpha, an alpha feature, but it, um, we were discussing about the promotion to beta, and it's actually the initial implementation, the initial intent of environment configs was to have uh, some kind of uh, environment dependent, as the name suggests, some environment dependent uh, data which you could pull in into your compositions, like a glorified config map, but it actually ended up being 
a, a lot of other things and being used in a lot of other different uh, ways. So it's actually, it actually became a way to share information between compositions. It actually became a way to patch resources uh, inside the uh, um, usual standard resource-based compositions. Uh, and obviously the API became extremely complex out of, of, uh, as a result of that. And it's obviously difficult to, it became a little bit difficult to maintain. So we think that the path forward for that is actually functions. And so let's have a little demo about function environment conflicts. So here, for example, you can see a uh, composition uh, using the old approach. Is it big enough? Yes. A bigger. This is an old style composition. As you can see here, we are defining an environment, environment configs, uh, a, a list of uh, selectors or references, either by label or by name. And uh, the usual approach, uh, and then we can use that for, uh, uh, from either a pipeline or the usual patch and transform based uh, compositions as we can see uh, uh, down there. But the usual approach, approach to debug this would have been to actually deploy again, uh, si similarly to what Jared showed earlier, it would have been to just deploy it in a real cluster with real environment configs and so it would, it would have been pretty hard to understand uh, what's going on without having stuff actually running in production or running somewhere. And um, so we actually, there is no support for the convert tool, but we are working on that. Uh, so we can actually see it's actually just a matter of pushing down the exact same configuration, function environment configs main uh, goal was to re-implement the same exact API as the inter implementation. And so we can actually see that uh, uh, we can uh, um, just use a, a yet another function, get all the resources. As I said, under the hood, it's using the extra resources functionality. And uh, uh, we can see that uh, you, we can actually run that. So how do we run that? We saw cross-plane beta render earlier, but it's actually, we, rec we recently introduced uh, some more flags to that. Two flags are the extra resources, as I was saying, so we can provide us a list of uh, um, YAML manifests that are going to be used by the cross-plane beta render uh, command to serve the resources to the, to the function if and when they, they ask for them. And we can actually also include the context uh, in the output so that we can see what it actually understood and what's putting into the context. So let's have a look at the actual result. Let me use my... As you can see, cross-plane beta render, include context, so we're going to see the context, uh, and extra resources, we pass the environment configs as a pure YAML, no need to uh, replicate the same logic uh, uh, as for uh, we, we would have had to do previously. We can see, for example, in this case, the uh, composite resource is produced with uh, an, uh, uh, a, spec, a field in the spec, in the status actually, coming from the environment, from uh, one of the environment configs we defined, and we can see it's actually the right, uh, uh, the right field coming from uh, the context. So in case of any issue, we could have had just run the same command. What's going on? What's the, what's the uh, actual result in the context? Why the, the context is not uh, updated? And that's, uh, that's the thing. And so let's go back to the slide with that. Let's go through a few other new features we introduced recently. Um, Server-side apply, you might have heard about that. Uh, usually uh, controllers in Kubernetes are written by uh, the control loop of controllers is usually getting resources, mutating them, and then updating. Uh, it was the only way that, uh, available when crossplane was started, but actually this has its problems, as you might know. It's usually it's complex to, uh, to handle non, uh, it's mainly additive, let's say, so it can remove state field from, uh, from an object. Uh, and it's all, uh, on arrays, it's hard to handle uh, existing elements maybe put in by another, uh, by another um, 
controller. So the solution to that is server-side apply. Uh, the, the Kubernetes solution to that is server-side apply. So let the API server figure it out for you. And uh, we already used server-side apply between composite resource and composed resources for uh, compositions uh, using functions. And then now we also have that capability between claims, so composite resource claims and composite resources. And you can, check, you can enable that uh, with uh, an alpha flag right now with enable SSA claims, but it's going to be promoted probably really soon. Real-time compositions, uh, it's usually compositions uh, are uh, re-executed and let's say re composed resources are, are re-updated uh, according to whatever uh, is your composition logic on a schedule, let's say, on, on, a, on an interval, or if uh, the composite resource is updated, but we weren't watching com uh, composed resources, so the downstream resources that your composition is creating. With uh, uh, this Alpha feature uh, behind uh, the enable real-time composition flag, you can actually uh, uh, tell Crossplane to dynamically spin up uh, uh, watches for composition, composed resources. And given that the API server is going to send events on any change to those composed resources, reactively, the Crossplane is going to reconcile all the uh, resources as needed. And so let me pass back the ball to to Jared. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, th thanks, Philippe. So as we saw in the, you know, when we're talking about getting ready for graduation, uh, we've, you know, the official formal proposal out there, we would not be where we are as a project without this entire community working together and building this thing, right? So many, many ways to get involved. Uh, probably the one thing to remember here is crossplane.io. You can go there and find links for all this stuff. We're very, very uh, active on Slack and GitHub and whatnot. Come chat with us and uh, you know, start getting involved in, in either building things for crossplane or building your own functions. We can talk about all of it. And then final thing here, uh, so you know, it's always good to know more about the people that are using Crossplane. So if you want to share your story with the public, uh, you know, with the rest of the community about how you're successful using Crossplane, uh, just go to the adopters.md file in the Crossplane repo and uh, share your story there. So we've got three minutes for questions, I believe, if I am doing my time right. There's a mic stand right there. Does anybody have a question that they want to ask? Oh, nice. You started walking towards that before I even said that. <laughs> um, about dependencies, so uh, do we, can we create dependencies in such a way that, uh, say, before I create a Postgres database, I need to wait for a VPC to be created? Can we do that? With yeah, there's a, there's a couple different ways to do that. One of the one of the common ones is the uh, like if you need a field from that particular uh, resource, then you can say uh, like in the patching policy for it, you can say it's a required field. So until I have that field, don't go any further. So that's one way to do it, depending on the use case. And then uh, like some of the functions Philippe was showing off, like function sequencer, you can in your function pipeline say this resource has got to get done before you even try to start this next resource. So there's a couple different ways to do something like that now. Uh, another minute for more questions? Anybody? Yeah. Do you have a question? No, I'm going to maybe repeat it for you out loud. Uh, yeah, so I would love to use Crossplane, but for the um, initialization of, like, say, an account in a cloud environment or the underlying like, instances for EC2 and then the cluster, is there some support for that? Or is it really after you have your cluster set up, it will do the infrastructure for that? Uh. Yeah, so the question is about like bootstrapping crossplane. Yeah, like like getting a cluster up and running. Uh, you know, having all the account information. Like, well, what do you use to do that first? Right? Do you want to take that, Philippe, or do you want? Uh, it's yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is no actual, uh, um, uh, if I got the question complete correctly, it's um, it's left to the user to, to handle that. Obviously, Crossplane runs in a Kubernetes cluster, so you need somewhere to be running the, the Crossplane controller. And so, yeah, the answer is no. But it's a similar issue you have with other uh, similar tools that needs to spin up a kind cluster to run some stuff on that, and then you, have to, you can create a cluster. Yeah, yeah no, I've seen people do that before, is like bootstrap a, a cluster with Kine. And then there, there are managed services for Crossplane as well if you don't want to spin up anything. So there's options for that too. Uh, 50 seconds. Anything else? Anybody else? You have? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the 
your talk, by the way. And uh, a quick question: You mentioned that like there's a cross-plane controller for every AWS resource. Um, so if I use the AWS provider, do I have to install like 300, 400, hundreds of controllers, or is it just on demand? Yeah. Really good question, because uh, maybe a year and a half ago or so, you did have to install the whole thing and have 900 controllers running, uh, which has a number of uh, issues, one of them being that the Kubernetes API scaling thresholds did not handle CRDs uh, scaling very well. So we essentially like tanked the entire control plane when you did that. So what we did is uh, separate them out into like families or groups of controllers. So you can install the S3 controller, the EC2 controller, the RDS controller, and have those specifically installed if you're going to use those services and not all, not all the other ones if you don't want to use those. Cool. All right, we are officially out of time. So thank you, thank you so much. And I'll probably just go hang out in the hallway for more questions. <laughs> <laughs>